second to Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. This can be found on page 783 of your pew Bibles, if you're following along, 783. Uh, but before we read this, let us uh, pause for a moment in prayer and invite the Spirit to be here with us. Gracious and Heavenly Father, as we today, Lord, approach this holy reading of your holy word, we know that we can understand that none of these things that you have told us without your spirit here to guide us and instruct us. So, Father, I pray that you breathe that spirit upon us today, Lord. Open our hearts and minds that we may see, we may hear, and we may understand your word and your will for us. And, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We're going to read the scripture passage, and then immediately following, there will be a brief silent meditation. We're at Matthew 1, 18 to 25, and listen now to the word of the Lord. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. I was training to be a chaplain. We had to go to this special school that they called Clinical Pastoral Education, or just CPE for short, Clinical Pastoral Education. And that was basically what it might sound like. It's chaplain's training. They, they take a young minister who wants to be a chaplain, they put him in what they call pastoral setting. And that's a setting outside of a church. So it's not in a, in a church office or in a formal counseling uh, a situation or in a, in a sanctuary preaching. It's kind of out in the world, out, out with people who might be having some form of difficulty. Uh, the most common place to do this CPE or clinical pastoral education was in a hospital. And I did two units, two different years in a hospital. And part of that training was, was being what we call what's called on call. It's your on call training. They, they give you the, the chaplain hospital pager. And anytime anybody wants to see a chaplain or there's any kind of situation arises, where the chaplain is supposed to show up, they call this pager up. And for you kids who don't know what a pager is, <laughs> a little black box that you can dial in and it, and it beeps and vibrates and makes all kinds of <coughs> unholy noise and it gives you a number to call. And so anytime anyone would, would, would want a chaplain, they would call this number and the on call chaplain would respond to the pager and go to wherever they were called in the hospital for this. And this could be any time this could be anywhere. Uh, to be on call, we had to stay overnight. We had a nice little on-call room we could sleep in if we wanted to, but usually on busy nights, there wasn't much sleep that you could get. The thing about being on call is you never knew what you were going to get called for. You would get lots of crazy, unexpected stuff. I mean, they were some of the usual stuff. People in a car accident or have a heart attack or or just uh, having a really bad fall or something. You get those kind of calls, but then you get some really, really just different kinds of calls or different kinds of situations. Like there was a one time I got called for a man who had been shot by his lover 
And then I had to explain what happened to his wife. And then there was a, you could get a time where I was called to the psychiatric wing in a hospital to talk to a woman who was claiming to hear the voice of God tell her to kill her child. And there was a time that a man came in who had tried to commit uh, suicide by shooting himself in the head with a crossbow. And it didn't work. Or the night when two men both came in with gunshots and they had shot each other. And you get called at any time, day or night. Usually 2 a.m. was a popular time to talk to a chaplain. I don't know what it was about 2 a.m., but that's when the chaplain was needed the most. But I realized eventually it was really good training in learning how to serve an unexpected Savior. Because you never knew when the Lord was going to call you. And you never knew exactly what He was going to ask you to do. What you had to eventually realize is that on call time is not your time. It was not my time. It was the hospital's time. And more specifically, it was the Lord's time. The time did not belong to me. And as the, the sooner I accepted that, the easier it was to go on with on call, to know that this was not my time and I had to expect anything. And I learned then the only way that we can really learn to serve an unexpected Savior is to realize that our life is not our own. That our life does not belong to us. It belongs to Jesus. And we've been talking this Advent season about Jesus being the unexpected Savior. And there's so many different ways that He is an unexpected Savior. And He was unexpected from the very moment that He entered into this world. See, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders that had long been waiting for this Messiah were waiting for a king. They were waiting for a conqueror, a mighty man from a mighty family that would come to put all the enemies of the Jewish nation underneath his foot. Instead, what they got was a, a, a child born to a young girl engaged and pregnant. What they got was a man that came that, that reached out to sinners. A man that, that dined and ate with prostitutes. A man that sat and talked with tax collectors. A man that also went to those same religious leaders and asked them, how could they expect to escape the fires of hell? It was not the Savior they thought they were getting. God, we come to discover and we come to learn is quite an unexpected God. And He is a God that will ask us to do unexpected things. Now, I don't think anybody knows this probably better than Joseph. As we, as we read in our story today, Joseph is a woman that really, really got taken by the unexpected. In fact, Joseph was blindsided by the unexpected. And I think it's a story that we can imagine ourselves in and really truly appreciate what Joseph had to go through. And it starts out, it tells us that Joseph, he was, like a lot of men that day, engaged to a young girl to be married. And uh, we don't know their exact ages, but if we take them to be averages, we can assume that Mary was probably about 15 or 16 years old, and Joseph was probably about 30. That was the average age of marriage for men and women in, uh, in, that, in that time period. And, uh, and Joseph, he, he's engaged to this young girl, and then all of a sudden he gets word one day that she's pregnant. And we don't know exactly how he found out this news, but it's probably a small town, and you know, word travels fast in a small town. But he found out that his fiance was pregnant, and, and he, might, he didn't know who the father was, but he did know that it wasn't him. He knew for sure that this child wasn't him, and he, and he hears this story, and there's a lot of ways he could have reacted to this. There's a lot of ways he could have reacted, a lot of things that he could have done, and it would have been a righteous way for him to act. By the law of the land of that day, by the, by the is, is, is Israelite law of that day, Joseph had a right to take Mary out to public, to have her shamed, and brought in front of everyone that she had broken the contract with him by laying with another man before she was married to him, and by law, he could have had her stoned to death. That was Joseph's right by law. He could have done that, and he would have been seen as a righteous man in the face of his entire community. 
and to have his fiance killed. But Joseph, we're told, didn't do this. He didn't do this. He was going to show mercy to Mary. His idea, his plan was to break off the engagement quietly. He was going to spare her the shame. He wasn't going to bring her in front of people and shame her publicly. He was going to just break off the marriage and dismiss her quietly. And we learn from this immediately that Joseph is a kind-hearted man. Joseph's a good man. He, he's a merciful kind of man. But it's at this point in the story that the really unexpected occurs. The Bible tells us as soon, just as Joseph was resolved to do this, to, to dismiss Mary, Mary quietly, he has a dream. He has an, an unexpected dream, not a normal dream at all. The Lord comes to him in a dream in the form of an angel. And he tells Joseph, it's okay to take this woman as your wife. Take her as your wife. Care for this child. Name him Jesus. Because this child is from the Holy Spirit. And he is going to save his people from their sins. And all of a sudden, in one moment, in one dream, Mary goes from being an unfaithful bride to be to the Holy One that is favored by God. You have to think, though, still, affirmed by God in a dream that it was okay to marry his, his new wife, new pregnant-to-be wife. This was still an incredibly difficult situation for Joseph to be in. Again, remember, this is a small town. You know people talk. You know how news travels around. You know what people are going to think. Joseph, engaged to be married. His fiance shows up pregnant, and you can only have that for so long. I don't care how big your robes are. They don't wear tight clothes in, but eventually they're going to find out that she's pregnant. And Joseph still does not dismiss her. Or break off the engagement. There's only one thing for people to think. Joseph got a little eager in his marriage. They jumped the gun a little bit. Not everyone had had the dream. And this is quite an awkward spot that Joseph was going to be stuck in. I mean, can you imagine the conversation that Joseph might have had with some of his friends? When he had to explain what was happening with him and Mary. You know, hey, Joseph. Congratulations. Getting married, and I hear you're a father too. Father to be. Congratulations, man. But what does Joseph say here? He's going to say, like, oh, no, the child's not mine. Really? It's not yours. Huh. And you're, uh, you're still going to marry her? Yeah, really, no, it's okay. The child is from the Holy Spirit. Really? Huh. <laughs> Child from the Holy Spirit. And, and, and Mary told you this? Yeah, yeah, she told me. Oh, and I had a dream too. It's from the Holy It's okay. She's God's child. Huh. Okay. <laughs> Man, I got to go. Look at the time. I've got something else to do. And what's the first thing you're going to do? Honey, you're not going to believe who I just talked to. Joseph, yes. Guess what? The child's not his. <clears throat> no, he says from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, he's still married her. You must really love her. I mean, what would the talk in the town be like about that? What would it be like to be Joseph? To walk around and know that you're probably being ridiculed by every single person in that town behind your back. Oh, look, there goes Joseph. A guy that thinks his fiance is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Hate what happened to that guy. No. Life would not be easy for Joseph, even having it confirmed in a dream. But then again, life is never easy serving an unexpected Savior. In fact, the only way we can really serve an unexpected Savior is to realize that our life is not our own. That our life does not belong to us. Our life belongs to Jesus. Now, a lot of us don't like that idea. That our life belongs to Jesus. That, that it's not our own. I mean, come on, we're Americans. Our life doesn't belong to anybody. We don't get owned by anybody else. We're free men and women. Nobody owns us. But unfortunately, Scripture is very, very clear on this point that we belong completely to the Lord. 
<laughs> Romans 6 reminds us this, and it calls us slaves to righteousness. Not people of righteousness, not children of righteousness. We are slaves to righteousness. 1 Corinthians 6.20, Paul says, flat out, you are not your own. You are not your own because you were bought with a price. Before we knew Jesus, every single one of us, every single one of us were slaves to evil. We were slaves to evil and we were ensnared in the kingdom of darkness, completely under the authority of sin. And being under the authority of sin, we were helpless in this state. We were slaves to sin. We couldn't help but sin because that was the dominion we lived under. And sin ruled over us. But when we were saved, Jesus, He bought us. He didn't just save us, He bought us. All that, all that we owed because of our sin was paid with Jesus. And He says, I have paid that debt. And He purchased us from the kingdom of darkness. And He placed us in the kingdom of God. And being freed from our sin doesn't mean now that, that we belong to ourselves, that we get to be whatever or whoever we want to be. It means we belong to the Lord. And if we're ever going to have a clear understanding of our relationship to God, we've got to understand this, that we belong to God. Our relationship with God is not a relationship of equals. It's not even a relationship of near equals. And it's not a relationship of volunteers who will say, Lord, I appreciate what you did. And you know, when I get a moment, I'll help you out whenever I can. Our relationship to God is a relationship of a slave and a master. He owns us, body, soul, and spirit. Now, He hasn't taken our choice away. We always have a choice. He never forces us to do anything, but our choice He always presents us with is always to be obedient to our Lord or be disobedient to our Lord. And the only way we can truly serve an unexpected Savior is like working on call at a hospital. You have to be ready at all times, at all places to obey His call, to understand that our life is not our own. Our life belongs to Jesus. Now this can be a very, very uncomfortable place to be. Knowing that we belong to Jesus. Knowing that we are owned by Christ. Because God loves to do unexpected things. The Lord loves to surprise us and ask unexpected things of His people. It's never boring serving the Lord because you never know what He's going to ask you to do next. Remember, this is the same God that told a 90-year-old childless couple named Abraham and Sarah, who probably thought their life was starting to finally wind down, told this old childless couple, your life is just starting. I want you to pick up, move to the other side of the world because you're going to be the mother and the father of a great nation. This is the same God that told a shepherd to get up and to take himself and a stick and go stand up to the greatest empire that the world had known at that time. This is the same God that told a little boy named David to go face down a giant with a rock and a little piece of leather. It's the same God that told the prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute. This is the same God that told three young men to go stand inside a burning furnace. It's the same God that told Joseph to take a young pregnant girl as his wife because her son would be the savior of the world. It forces us to ask ourselves, what is he going to ask me to do? Because he's just as unexpected now as he's ever been. And he's still asking his people to do unexpected things. He's asked vice presidents of large corporations to give up six and seven figure jobs to be pastors of small churches. He's asked housewives to go serve homeless, serve the homeless in the ghettos of India. He's asked straight-laced accountants to go be missionaries in a place where it is illegal to be a Christian. He's asked soldiers to put their weapons down and begin to preach the gospel to the enemy 
that they were trying to kill. What's he going to ask you to do? It's a scary thought. Because he could ask us anything. It's a scary thought to know that our life doesn't belong to us. Our life belongs to Jesus. And our God is quite the unexpected Savior. I had to learn this a lot being a chaplain in the hospital. I remember one night in particular it was put in, in, in particularly stark contrast for me. I remember one night there's two men I had to visit. Two, one young boy, one an older man. And early on in the evening I was called to this, this young boy who was 19 years old who had gotten suddenly ill. He had, he had this awful infection. And the doctors came around and they said, well, we're pretty hopeful about this. I think we got the infection under control. The boy's going to do okay. And so I, I gathered around with a family who was still scared and, and we prayed for, for God's healing and, and for strength and, and for all just the good things for him to rise up and fight the infection. Then a few hours later, I was called over to the emergency room. Older man had been brought in, 90 years old. <clears throat> he, was a, he was a survivor of Pearl Harbor, actually. A man who had lived a long life, a good life. His, his blood pressure was down near the floor. His heart rate was hardly noticeable at all. The doctor said, well, there's nothing we can do for him. He's an older guy. He's had his life. We're just going to let him go. And the, the prayer we had that day, or that moment with that family, was for an easy and a peaceful death. And the, ne the next day, I went to go visit both of them. It was my habit to, to go visit the people I'd prayed for the night before. And I went to go see the 19-year-old, and his infection had taken a turn for the worse. It had suddenly spiraled out of control. The doctors weren't unsure what to do. Family was really on edge now. Three days later, a young man died. I went from there with that awful news to go to the ER to see this 90-year-old again. And, and I walked in and I found this room empty. So I went to the nurse and I said, well, what, what time did he die last night? And she said he didn't die. She said he woke up. He's over in the heart, heart hospital right now. And just completely blown away and surprised, I go immediately to the heart hospital and I see this man who was right on death's door just a few hours before sitting up and he's eating breakfast. And I went in and introduced myself, and he said, God is good. That, that situation has always confused me. I've always questioned that one night more than any other night that I've been in chapel. And I always, I walked away that day, and I walked away still asking, why did God do that? Why did he do that? Why, why, did, he, why did he save the older one, and he, and he let the younger one go? That's not, that's not what I would have done. That's not what makes sense in my mind. And I've wrestled with that question for, for years and years. And the only answer I've been able to come up with is we serve an unexpected Savior. And He does unexpected things. Sometimes those things can scare us. Sometimes they frustrate us. Sometimes they really hurt us. But they almost always leave us confused and wondering. Then we have to remember, or I have to remember, eventually remember that our life isn't ours. Our life doesn't belong to us, and nor is the life of everybody in this world and everybody we know. That life belongs to somebody else. Someone greater than us. Someone higher than us. Someone whose, whose understanding is way beyond ours and also whose love is much greater than a love that we can ever experience. But then I have to remember that everything that we celebrate here at Christmas, the hope, the joy, the love, all of this is only possible because of an unexpected Savior. One who loved us enough that he did the most unexpected thing that a God could do. He became a little child to bring salvation to all of us. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Friends, will you pray with me? Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. Father, we come to you as your people, people of empty hearts and empty hands, Lord, as your empty vessels. We pray, Lord, that you fill us with your spirit. Lord, fill us with your goodness, Lord, with your instruction, your wisdom, your power, and your might. And Father, I pray that in this season that you remind us that we are not our own, that we belong to you. And Father, for those that uh, this news is, is a burden, Lord, may you lighten that burden with your grace. For those of us who's, who, who experience this as a trial, Lord, may we have your strength through this trial. And Father, may the day come when we experience this as good news and great joy. That we belong to you. Father, may we one day have the hearts to take this news and know that it is the greatest gift that you can give us. That we do not belong to ourselves, but that we belong to you. Father, I pray that you give us those hearts that seek to serve you and only you. Hearts that want to see you magnified, Lord. Hearts that want to see you glorified. Hearts that desire to shepherd our brothers and sisters in the ways of righteousness. That they too can know the joy and the peace of being owned by you. And Father, we lift up to you all the prayers of this congregation. Those prayers spoken and unspoken. Father, I pray that you hear the cries of every heart here. Father, I pray that your spirit move among them and grant them comfort and peace and knowledge and joy. And Father, we lift up those of you, those, Lord, in this congregation and their families and friends that are sick and in need of healing. Father, we lift up Jill and Libby. We lift up Nick and Barbara and pray that your healing spirit move among them and strengthen them. And Father, we lift up Anna and pray for a safety for both mother and child. Father, we pray for a safe delivery and strength for them both. Father, we pray for all those that grieve in this time of celebration. Father, we pray that you give them a special comfort in this Christmas season, especially we lift up the Archie and the Pearson family. But we also lift up all those grieve and pray that your comfort and peace be with them, our God. Lord, we lift up all those that are traveling this holiday. We pray you surround them with your angels, Lord, bringing them safely to their destination and safely home again. Father, and in all these things, may we remember why we celebrate. Not our work, but your work. The work of your Son, our Savior Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, friends, let us stand and say what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. And those words can be found in the inside back cover of your hymn books. Friends, what is it you believe? <laughs> 